Good morning. If you wouldn't mind standing with me, please. We're working our way through Scripture verse by verse. We're in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 21 this morning. Paul is uh, heading back towards Jerusalem. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them, those at Ephesus, and set sail, running the straight course, we came to Kos, and the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera, and finding the ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailing to Syria and landing at Tyre. But there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. And we, he had come to the end of those days. We departed and went our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave from one another... We boarded the ship, and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Potelmas and greeted the brethren and stayed there one day. And on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, staying with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days with him, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Lord, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And now when we heard these things, we, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And so when he would not be persuaded, we ceased finally saying, The will of the Lord be done. Let's stop there and pray. Thank you, Lord, that it's your will for us to grow in you. We ask that you would uh, speak to us from Paul's struggles here and friends that are giving him advice that are really not of you. We've all had that happen, Lord, so we pray that you would send your spirit to teach us that we might leave this place more like you and less like us. Do that, we ask in Jesus' name. And all of God's children agreed by saying, amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. So this section is about advice, taking advice or, or really guidance. I love the story about the guy that bought a brand new BMW, been one on one all his life, decided to take it for a long drive, went out to the country, got pretty far out, And suddenly, his brand new Beamer died, pulled to the side of the road, got out, looked around, tried his cell phone. He's out in the middle of nowhere. He sees some horses, and there's a barbed wire fence. And and he opened the hood of the car, not because he knew anything about cars, but that's what guys do. You know, you look like you know what you're doing. And a horse is walking towards him, he noticed. And uh, he had his head in there, and, and he's looking around. And suddenly, he heard someone say, your problem is your fuel injection pump. And he got back up and looked, and there's nobody around except this horse leaning against the fence. And he looks way off, and there's a cowboy working on the fence, and he, he, he runs down to him, and he says, I can't believe it. I, I, I think I just heard a horse tell me how to fix my car. The cowboy looked at him, he said, uh, big gray stallion. He said, yeah, that's the horse. Listen, I wouldn't take any advice from him. He can fix tractors, but he doesn't know anything about foreign cars. (laughs) So this section, I know, I know. I'm always stretching to make a joke fit the story that we're studying here. This study is about giving and taking advice, so it does work. Hang with me. 
knowing God's will, guidance. So believers are just as inclined to give advice today to protect whatever person they're speaking to. It's a loving, compassionate move, but often it's bad advice. We're trying to protect our, them as well as ourselves from any kind of pain or suffering. That seems to be a built-in response. Psychologists tell us it's called pain avoidance. It's the organism trying to keep itself surviving and out of pain. But that is not good advice if it's God showing you something different, which is really what this story is about. Our will being done versus God's will. The importance of walking in the will of God is painfully obvious to those of us who spent a long time getting any brains at all and coming to the Lord. So the essence, the foundation, the secret of growing and maturing in the Christian life is obeying God's will. Now, when believers especially go seeking advice, seeking guidance, they usually ask questions like, should I marry this person or not? Or uh, should I move so I can take advantage of this new job? Or what school should I go to for college? All legitimate questions. The unstated question though is, how do I achieve maximum joy with minimum suffering? That is, in reality, an important question. The real one is, though, what's God's will for my life? What is it that he wants me to do? The physician, David Livingston, the famous medical missionary to Africa, spent more than 40 years there, and he wrote in his journal of a story where he was chased by lions up a tree, literally, and he climbed up and it was the only tree he could get to and it was kind of small and, and he could barely, he said, climb the tree high enough to get away from the reach of the lions, two lions trying to get to him. If he went too high, the tree would start to bend and he knew it'd bend over and the lions would get him. So he just stopped in the crook of this tree and he finally fell asleep. When he, wake, when he wakes up in the morning, the, the lions are gone. But he wrote in his diary this, I had a good night and felt happier and safer in that little tree besieged by lions in the jungles of Africa in the will of God than I would have been out of the will of God relaxing in my home country, England. Hmm, interesting perspective of life. Oswald Chambers, his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, many of us have read it, he wrote this, to choose to suffer means that there's something seriously wrong with you. <laughs> to choose God's will, if and even if it means suffering, that, that's very different. No healthy saint ever chooses suffering. He chooses God's will, as Jesus did, whether it means suffering or not. You know, if you really want to suffer, I remember as a young boy, I was uh, in a parochial school and they, they were trying to say that, you know, it's really good to suffer. And I'm going, <laughs> no, I don't think so. I'm going to try and avoid it if at all possible. But choosing the will of God that might include suffering is something different. That's really what we're looking at here. The year is about 57 AD. Paul the Apostle has been serving the Lord for about 20, 21 years. He has been on three missionary journeys. We've been following him on those journeys through the book of Acts. Uh, he now is finishing up his third missionary journey. He has traveled all over what was called Asia Minor in those days, and then into Europe, including uh, the areas of North and South Greece, two separate countries, Macedonia in those days, and Acacia. And uh, he is uh, now heading back down the west coast, heading toward of Asia Minor, heading towards Jerusalem. This uh, section breaks up into three parts. First, he's told, don't go to Jerusalem, verse 1 through 4. And then a second time, prophets tell him, don't go to Jerusalem, verse 5 through 12. And then finally, 
do it even if God's will means suffering in the last two verses. So that's where we're going. It creates an interesting dilemma, I think, for all of us as believers. And that is uh, trying to put aside that built-in pain avoidance reaction and replace it with, I want to serve God, even if there's a cost involved that I don't like. So let's jump in and see what God might say to us. Verse 1, now it came to pass. I really like those five words, that things come into my life to pass. They're not permanent. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them, all these elders, if you were with us last time, who came down from Ephesus, the capital city of Asia Minor, and there were many churches that were started there, and the pastors came down, and Paul gave them a farewell address. That's where we stopped last, at the end of chapter 20, last time. And when we departed from them, we set sail, running the straight course, we came to Kos. Now, Kos with the C in those days is K-O-S, Kos, with the, and it's one of the uh, beautiful islands in the middle of the Aegean Sea, in the Mediterranean. And it's on the route, uh, they're kind of skipping island to island and sometimes onto the mainland to get down to Jerusalem. First they came to Kos, following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. So Kos looks like this, this is the map. They started up in Miletus, which is just below, 30 miles below Ephesus, and they are heading, as you can see, south down the west coast of Turkey. That's what it looks like today. So when you think poor Paul, he's just suffering with Jesus, <laughs> this is uh, one of the most beautiful spots in the world. These are the Greek islands, a premier place to vacation if you're a European and even some Americans. Uh, that's the main cargo, the main marketplace in, uh, on the island of Kos. And, uh, that's probably where they stopped. There's a little sheltered cove there, just a tiny island off the coast of Kos, and you can see it's not bad. And sometimes I feel like a travel agent up here. Uh, but I'm encouraging you to do this, not because you should just travel, but because of the scriptural connections. This is an artist drawing, obviously, of... Uh, the Colossus of Rhodes. That's the harbor, a real picture of the harbor entrance into uh, Rhodes. Uh, That's what it looks like today, the bunch of folks from the church when we were there a couple years ago. And it's across that space where this huge, one of the seven wonders of the world, over a hundred foot tall, with a huge cauldron on the top that someone would climb and put oil in and light it every night as a lighthouse. Uh, This is a uh, again, the main market area, the Cardo, uh, there on roads. Again, spectacularly beautiful and easy to visit. They went from there, we were told, down to Patera. And um, that's where uh, they will run into another beautiful spot. And uh, it's not an island. The Patera is actually uh, uh, about 60 miles from Rhodes on the, again, the West Coast. So back up to Kos just a minute. Um, in 460 BC, there was a, a Greek born there, Hippocrates, and that's where we get the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Uh, he was the father of medicine. The first medical school in the world was there in uh, the fifth century BC, before God. And this uh, Patera is another interesting city Uh, for the man born there. The man born there, his name was Nicholas, and uh, he's uh, called Saint Nicholas uh, in Orthodox and Catholic churches, and yes, uh, he is uh, Santa Claus. He was born 280 AD in that capital city, Patera. So they're still going down the coast, verse 2, finding the ship sailing over to Phoenicia. We went aboard, set sail, Uh, the coastal area north of Israel, uh, Phoenicia, called Lebanon today. In those days, it was a a country known for 
sending out merchant ships all over the world. The Phoenicians were famous for trading. It's about a 400-mile trip down from uh, there, uh, and uh, the ship was probably a little bit larger so they could make that trip. Uh, they moved to a bigger trip, uh, bigger trip, yeah, bigger ship to go a longer trip, verse 3. And when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, so they're on the outside. They went around the island of Cyprus and sailed to Syria, landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload their cargo. Now, Tyre is in the news a lot. It's uh, just south of Beirut that uh, a lot of a lot of exchange of missiles and fire and, and cell phones and pagers blowing up there in the last week or so. Uh, so a hot spot uh, in the war. And when they got there, they found disciples, verse 4 said. Churches were springing up all over the Mediterranean. The Levant area was full of uh, churches that a lot of them were people that had had fled Jerusalem, interestingly enough, from Saul of Tarsus, who we are studying as Paul the Apostle. And so as they were scattered throughout the Levant, uh, they started little house churches. And that's true um, here about uh, this uh, city of Tyre or Phoenicia or Beirut. So they stayed there many days. These believers, it would seem, were unknown to him, but they were probably a result of his persecution. And then something happened. They told Paul, the apostle, through the Spirit, a gift of the Spirit, to not go up to Jerusalem. And this sets the scene for what I want you to think about just a little bit. It was very spiritual advice, it says, from well-meaning people who wanted to help Paul, wanted to keep him from suffering or from pain, and so they give him the advice, don't go. Now, this is the first time in this section. He had actually been warned back in the last chapter, if you were with us, verse 22, and see, Paul said, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem knowing that things will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. I'm going anyway, is what he's saying, because I'm sure that's what God wants me to do. What? God wants you to go somewhere that will cause you to be arrested, tortured, and eventually be killed. Nero will, in fact, behead Paul in his final day outside of Rome itself. So notice it's not a command from the Holy Spirit for Paul not to go to Jerusalem. It isn't that Paul is being disobedient to God. He's right in the center of what God wants him to do and be. He tries to convince them that he's doing what God wants him to. He's not blowing it. This is God, even though it ends in pain. That doesn't sound right, Pastor. I know. I've said that to the Lord many times in my life. And so far, he doesn't take my advice very good. Have you noticed that? Don't go to Jerusalem, number one. Second section, verse 5 through 12, don't go to Jerusalem, number 2. And when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way. And they all accompanied us, wives and children, till we were out of the city and knelt down on the shore and prayed. It's really a touching scene. These believers have only known Paul for a week, but they already have this relationship. They feel close that they want to go with him and pray for him. And they're scratching their head trying to figure out why he would go there knowing that he's going to be arrested. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home, and we headed south. Now, take our leave is an interesting Greek word. You remember that it's Dr. Luke that wrote the book of Acts, and he uses a technical term to have to pull yourself away. It was really hard for them to separate 
it was difficult to leave is what he's saying here. There were tears, seven days. Wives and children had all come. I, I think Paul the Apostle is one of the first people on my list that I want to meet when we get to heaven. I, I just want to know this guy. He sounds like he's really interesting. Wow, you think? But, uh, but he must be a, a, an interesting personality too. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, the head itself, we came to Ptolemus, greeting the brethren, stayed with him one day. Again, they arrived to a beautiful spot. It's about 23 miles south. That's the city today. Um, it is uh, called Acre today, or Acco, A-C-C-O, and uh, right on the Mediterranean, uh, ancient city, uh, old cannon ports there in the wall, a lighthouse, and uh, it's just, again, it's uh, a beautiful spot. It's the main part of the region until Herod would come to Jerusalem and build out the next place they're going, Caesarea, um, and they stayed there uh, just one day. And then they head south again down to the port that Herod had on the next day. We were with we who were Paul's companions. Notice the word we. Over and over again, Dr. Luke uses that. He's, that's him saying, I was with them. I'm an eyewitness. You can trust what I'm writing. I was with the Apostle Paul. So the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea, entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven. Stayed with him, one of the seven. Yeah, all the way back in Acts chapter 6, you'll remember the church was exploding, growing like crazy in the city of Jerusalem, so much so that Paul, uh, or excuse me, so much so that the apostles couldn't keep everyone taken care of, so they appointed six elders, six deacons to take care of, and Philip was one of them. So we've run into him before. So they stayed in the house of Philip here. This is an aerial photograph, obviously, of the harbor that Herod built. It's up on the top, the first half circle. Uh, the big one at the bottom uh, was also built by him. But all the things that go out as points of the lander man made. The Romans in the first century made a technological discovery. They discovered they could make concrete poured concrete, hardened underwater by adding calcium carbonate to it, what burned. Anyway, uh, we won't go into all the chemistry of that. You know that's my shortcoming. So, uh, but underwater, they, they built out all those uh, dikes to stop the water. Down in the bottom left corner is Herod's Temple, what's left of it. Notice the square area that's dug out with water in it. That was Herod's swimming pool. To the right of it was his jacuzzi, and he brought hot water from a spring, and he had a jacuzzi, and it spilled over into the swimming pool. It was self-cleaning because at high tide, then the tide would come in and clean it all out. Low maintenance, beautiful spot. Um, it is uh, there that Paul will end up being brought to, we'll see as we work our way through Acts, and appeared in a court there. Uh, the uh, Hippodrome, the, that's where the horse races were, the long uh, extended looking flat area right in the center of the picture. They did chariot racing and they did horse racing very much like still continues today at Santa Anita or places like that. So, uh, again, look at the waves. It's just a spectacularly beautiful spot, but Paul's not on vacation. He's on his way to Jerusalem. So, um, we have uh, about 30 miles south is the Caesarea Maritime, the Roman seat of government, and uh, Paul meets Philip the evangelist. Now, Philip was faithful in little things. He was waiting tables, actually, in Jerusalem uh, way, way back in chapter 6. And then uh, the Holy Spirit asked him to go north to Samaria. So he went up to the area of Israel called Samaria. And there, as he preached the gospel, many Samaritans were saved. So he's an evangelist. He's the only person in the New Testament 
that's called an evangelist. He had this special call on his life. Um, Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, but he's, you know, this man, Philip, is the only one that's actually called that. So let me remind you of the story. I encourage you to go read it in chapter 6 through 8. So Philip uh, is there up in the north in Samaria. People are getting saved. It's revival. It's a wonderful thing that's happening. And the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, I want you to go south. Uh, really, Lord, I don't want to leave now. Look, everything is going really well. I want you to go south. I want you to go down the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Hmm. This is uh, verse 5 of chapter 8. Philip went down to, uh, from the city of Samaria and preached Christ in them. The angel spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then this ominous three-word statement, this is desert. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. And it was. It is. It's, now, so let's imagine you are um, Philip, and you're feeling really good because you're able now to preach the gospel. People are listening. They're getting saved. And God says to you, uh, uh, Gary, I want you to go to 29 Palms. Uh, maybe uh, Baker. <laughs> I didn't mean to offend anyone from 29 Palms. Um, so I want you to go to the desert. There's nothing there. You know, Gaza's in the news now, but uh, there wasn't much there. Been on this road many times. Those of you who've been to Israel with this, you know that road. And uh, there's nothing there. Zip, zero. And so he's walking along this road, going south to Gaza because God told him to. And he hears something behind him. He turns around and look, and there's a, a chariot coming. And as he sees it coming, he sees there's a black man in the chariot in the back sitting down reading a scroll. Somebody else is driving, obviously. And it, uh, and it comes up next to him, and the Holy Spirit says, run, Philip, and catch the chariot. Now, he's already a long way from where he's comfortable. He's in the middle of the desert. It's hot. And now God says, sprint. <laughs> and so he's running alongside the chariot, and uh, he looks over, and he sees he's reading this scroll, this Ethiopian eunuch. It turns out he's actually the treasurer of the, city, of the nation of Ethiopia. He'd just been to Jerusalem. He's brought a scroll, scroll of Isaiah, 66 chapters. He's reading along. And Paul looks, or excuse me, Philip looks over and says, uh, what are you reading? He said, well, it's the book of Isaiah. And Philip says, do you understand it? And he says, no, how can I understand it? I need somebody to tell me what it means. And he just happens to be reading the part that describes the Messiah, the suffering servant, as dying for the sins of mankind. So Philip, he says, come aboard. So Philip jumps in the chariot, and they're cruising along, and he's explaining the gospel to him. He uses that, because that's all there were at the Old Testament in those days, and he explains Jesus is the Messiah, his death, burial, and resurrection. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, uh, what would prevent me of being baptized? I want Jesus as my Savior. And Philip says, uh, there's some water. Okay. And they stop, gets out. He baptizes him in the water. And it says, when the eunuch came out of the water, Philip found himself 40 miles north. I cannot explain it to you any more than that. Well, that's impossible for us. Yes, nothing is impossible for God. That's what happened. Now we find this same guy, Philip, another 50 miles north in the city of Caesarea by the sea. So 20 years earlier, the Ethiopian eunuch had happened, and uh, now uh, this man has children. He obviously met someone, married, stayed in Caesarea, verse 9. This man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Godly young women. The, the Greek word suggests that they were preteens or early teenagers. Young women, unmarried, 
who had the gift of prophecy. So Philip has raised his children right. He has four teenage daughters with an attitude. Why do I say that? I have two who were teenage daughters at one time, and they automatically come with an attitude. I'm sorry, ladies, it just happens. Something about 12 years old, the brains run out, and, and they just become a challenge. All right, we'll leave it at that. Now, how did they do? Well, 100 years later, the church historian uh, Eusebius wrote this about those four daughters. The daughters lived to a great age and were highly esteemed as informants on persons and events foretelling the future belonging to the early years of Christianity. So Philip raised them right. Raising our kids to serve the Lord is one of the most important, if not the most important job that you have, parents. Uh, we're to teach our children about the Lord. Well, that's easy to say, Pastor. How do you get them to follow the Lord? I have a two-word answer. Live it. Walk it out in front of them. Don't just talk the talk, parents. And, and I came across years ago a wonderful six rules for parents from a woman who I was greatly impressed with, Susan Wesley. I never met her, of course, 1600s. She's the mother, number one, of 12 children. For that, we go, <laughs> great mom. Okay, but two of them were John and Charles Wesley, the founders of Methodism, and uh, all 12 of her kids walked with the Lord all their lives. Now, we still sing some of the hymns that Charles Wesley has written, and, uh, and so she did it right. If you read the history of England, the early 1700s, uh, the, these two men caused the history of England to be changed. They were the first to build orphanages, the very first to have soup kitchens, the first to feed the poor, uh, to really put practical uh, impact into Christianity and they influenced the loss of slavery. Wilberforce was a friend of theirs, and so they were a force, and you can read this from secular historians, that changed the direction of the nation of England. So I was really interested in knowing what this woman did. She has six rules. Number one, how to raise children. Number one, subdue self in a child. Self-will and thus work together with God to save his soul. That does not compute by today's psychology, okay, that you um, try and limit the kid's self-will. We say, well, we need to increase their self-esteem, let them discover themselves, do anything they want, express themselves their opinion. She says, no, subdue self-will and work together with God, number two. Teach him to pray as soon as he can speak. The first words that her sons used were praying to God. So they became conversant with God. Number three, give him nothing that he cries for and only what is good for him if he asks for it politely. Wow, this is like stuff from outer space, isn't it? <laughs> give him nothing that he cries for, demanding only what's good for him, number one. And number two, only if he asks for it politely. Whew. Number four, to prevent lying, punish no fault that is freely confessed. Sounds just like what God does. But never allow a rebellious, sinful act to go unnoticed. So as long as the kid confesses, you forgive him. Number five, commend and reward good behavior. Well, of course, we all do that. No, no. She meant we forget to do that a lot. When our kid's doing well, we don't tell them enough. When they're doing bad, we tell it, you know, all the time. Number six, strictly observe all promises you have made to your child. Ooh. Promise your kid something, just make sure you do it. 
Again, live out what you say, and your kids will see it, and they'll say, hey, that actually works. I see it working in dad's life. I see it working in mom's life. Sure is quiet in here. I know, I'm going against the flow. That's what we do. We're fish going against the flow. Verse 10. And as we stayed there many days, Caesarea, with Philip's house and his children, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now, this prophet, Agabus, we ran into earlier in Acts chapter, uh, in Antioch in Acts 11. He was a prophet there, and he prophesied that there would be a terrible famine that would sweep the Middle East, and it did for 12 years. And so from 42 to 54 AD, secular history records it. So when he comes down, everybody listens. This guy has something to say to Paul, well-respected prophet. And he brings Paul a, well, a clear message, we'll say, verse 11. And when he had come to us, he takes Paul's belt and think, not a leather belt, but think like a, you're wearing a bathrobe, the, the cloth belt that goes around it. That's what Paul would have been wearing in the first century. He took Paul's belt and he bound his own hands and feet and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt Everybody looks at Paul and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, why is he doing this street theater? Why is he acting this out? Well, it, when you become conversant, familiar with the Old Testament, many of the Old Testament prophets did that. God told Isaiah to go walk around semi naked in a loincloth. And so for three years, he walked around town. Good thing it's a warm climate. And he, uh, and he was acting out a prophecy. He was illustrating how the northern kingdom was about to be conquered by Assyria, and they would be taken in their loincloths into captivity as slaves. And he's warning them, return to the Lord, or this will happen. Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah was told by God to build a, a yoke, a, a wooden yoke like an oxen would use with a big loop that went under him, and he was to wear that around. And, and so he did to warn the inhabitants of Jerusalem that they would be yoked by these heathen armies, the kings that were coming, and lest they turn to God, they were going to be used like animals to pull plows in the fields of Assyria, and they were. Ezekiel he was told to make a, first a clay tablet and make a picture of Jerusalem, put it down and build a ramp around it and, and a siege mound. That's what ancient armies did to starve out a city, keep food from coming in and water. And so he did, and then he made a little model of the city of Jerusalem, did the same thing. All of us to to point out that that's exactly what was going to happen if they didn't return to the Lord. So that's what Agabus is doing. It's a long tradition to go back hundreds of years as he binds up his own hands and his own feet, and he says, the owner of this belt, it's going to happen to him. So Paul's arrest was part of God's plan. It should change the way we read the rest of the book of Acts. Then Luke adds this key statement, verse 12. And when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Again, they were right. He was going to suffer, and they were trying to keep him from pain. That's what good friends do. Unless you're contradicting what God wants to do in that believer's life. So, Jesus had told him that suffering would be part of his ministry way back when he got saved. Acts chapter 9, Paul is Saul of Tarsus, and he's capturing Christians, bringing them back to Jerusalem where they were stoned to death for blasphemy. And so he's basically arresting Christians, taking them back, and they're, and they're being killed. So he's on his way to another country now. He's expanded his outreach 
and he's on his way to Damascus. He's on the road to Damascus. You remember the story. And God knocks him down, and he knocks him blind. He hits him so, I don't know how he did lightning, whatever. But Paul's on the ground, and uh, he said, uh, and, and God says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? <laughs> Which I, terribly ironic statement back to God. I know you must be somebody really powerful because I'm down here and I can't see a thing. And so uh, God tells him he's going to go to Damascus, and there he's going to stay with a man, and he does, Ananias, and he's living in this man's house, and the Holy Spirit says to Ananias through an angel, go tell the apostle Paul. So this is uh, Ananias. Uh, this man, Saul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So his initial invitation into the body of Christ, into faith, is shockingly simple. It's going to be tough. Scripture makes it clear that serving the Lord is not a plush walk, a journey that's filled with good things. The uh, careful reading is take up your cross and follow him. Wow. So Oswald Chambers, again, wrote this about suffering. We all know people who have been made much meaner and more irritable and more intolerable to live with by suffering. So it's not right to say that all suffering perfects. In fact, it only perfects one type of person, the one person who accepts the call of God in their lives by Christ Jesus. Suffering is the heritage of the bad, of the penitent, those who repent, and of the Son of God. What? Each one ends on the cross. The one who, the thief that refused and mocked Jesus, he ended up on a cross. The one who repented and cried out for mercy to Jesus, he ends up on a cross, and the Son of Man ends up on the cross for you and for me. These signs we know, the heritage of a believer is often suffering. Last section, 13, Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? You're killing me here, he's saying. For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm not, I'm ready to be bound. This is something God has already told me. The suffering was ahead of me. Don't try and keep me from it. It's his will for my life. Acts 20, 24, we looked at last week. He said, but none of these things moved me that I was going to be persecuted, nor do I count my life as dear to myself, so that I might finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace, the gifts of God to me and to others. I don't count my life so dear that I'd quit serving the Lord. It's not going to dissuade me. Do not be afraid, God told him in Acts 18.9. Don't be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you, for I've made many people in this city needy. So God is saying, don't worry about it right now. You're not going to be killed in Jerusalem. <laughs> okay, that's great. Where am I going to be killed? God doesn't tell him, but we know history what happened. So, Make yourself ready for God's will in your life. How do you do that? This is what Paul wrote to the Romans recently, right after this. I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, logical service. And be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world push you into a mold, 
but be transformed, metamorphized from the inside out, transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of the Lord. So how do you do such things? Number one, you stay in the word. In God's word every day. So he can remind you. Number two, you seek godly counsel. Godly counsel. Uh, Proverbs 11, 14. In a multitude of counselors there is wisdom. Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, plans go awry. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Make sure the counsel that you get is godly. In number or Psalm 1, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. And then number three, situations are not the primary source of guidance. When you find yourself in a difficult situation, Satan whispers in your ear, you know, if you were a more of a Christian, then you wouldn't be going through these bad things. No, no, that's a lie from the pit of hell. The Lord makes it to rain on the good and the evil. Have you noticed? <laughs> Bad things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people, and good things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. So, God is wanting us to serve him, the gospel of grace. Verse 14, and when he would not be persuaded, they couldn't convince Paul otherwise, we quit bothering him. We see saying, the will of the Lord be done. Wow. There's a reverberating thought. If I just do what God wants me to do, I'll be fine. There's a lot of people that have uh, done this besides Paul, of course. William Tyndall uh, was uh, an Englishman who was told that he couldn't translate the Bible from Latin into English. And if he did, that he might be killed. And so he counted the costs. He did it anyway. And in fact, his copy of the first English Bible was ripped off by King James, and we know it as the King James Version. And he was killed for translating it. Billy Graham, 1949. God told him to go start doing crusades, and his best friend... Chuck Templeton told him the Bible wasn't reliable. Don't trust that. There's things in it that are the Word of God, but there's a lot of it that we don't know. And Billy prayed at Forest Home, <laughs> just up the road from us, and uh, God used him. What if he had not done that? What, look at the, the hundreds of thousands of people that have gone forward all over the world. We took the gospel to places, Vietnam that no one had ever heard the gospel preached publicly like that. Jonah, <laughs> Old Testament. God tells him to go to Nineveh, which was to the east, and he went west. <laughs> God helped him with a whale of a problem to get back to where he was supposed to be. But he did end up doing what God wanted him to do. Several years ago, Brother Andrew... God's smuggler, some of you know that name, spoke here. And uh, I wasn't surprised, but I wrote down what he said. He said, there's not one door in the world closed where you can't witness for Jesus. Show me a closed door, and I will tell you how you can get in. I can't, however, promise you that you'll get back out. Jesus didn't say go if the doors are open because they weren't. <laughs> he didn't say go if you have an invitation or a way to get back out. He simply said go because people are dying in the world without even seeing a Bible. So we started by a... Uh, a poor joke about advice, about a horse giving advice. In 1940, uh, this article appeared in the Detroit Free Press. We'll close with this. It says, earlier this week, an old Model T Ford was pulled off 
to the side of the road outside of the city with this hood up. Two kids in the back seat and a young dad desperately cranking on it. This is before they even had electric starts. If you go look at the one in the, in the front there, you'll see that. Um, he was sweating. He'd been working at it for a long time without any success when a shiny new black 1944 convertible pulled around him, it stopped, backed up, and a well-dressed older man got out. The man watched the young dad working for a while without saying a word. Quietly, he stepped up and suggested that the young man take off the distributor cap and look at the points on the motor. He then asked the young dad, when he looked at it, to make a minor adjustment by opening the points. The young man was skeptical, but nothing else had worked, so he did what the man suggested. Now the older man said confidently, your engine will run. Give it a crank. Good win. Boom. He cranked it once, and sure enough, the engine started running like a brand new engine. The young man was amazed that this well-dressed older man in a suit knew so much about cars. So he asked him, how did you know exactly what to do? Well, the older man said, my name is Henry Ford. I designed and I created this car. I know every nut and bolt, screw and rivet in it. I know what it can do and many of the things it can't do. Then he handed the young dad his business card and said, if you ever need to know anything about this car, call me and I'll help you free of charge. You were created by God. Every cell in your body, God knows, and placed there the pattern for it in 46 chromosomes. When you're in trouble, go to the Creator. Would you stand, please, and we'll pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have called us out of darkness into the light. Most of us in this room understand that, and we thank you for it. But some probably here this morning have been listening and are struggling because they've never surrendered to you. We ask that you would give them the grace to do that now. Christians, please pray. So I wonder if there's someone here this morning, and I suspect there are several, whom you're visiting and you've never asked God to take control of your life. You've never asked him to forgive your sins. We're going to give you that opportunity. We won't do anything to embarrass you. But if you would like to know that your sins are forgiven, if you'd like to know that you're going to spend eternity with God, if you're ready to surrender your life to him, would you let me know you're ready by looking up at me and raising your hand? And I'll take that to mean I want my sins forgiven. God bless you, young lady. A couple, yes, God bless you. Right in front of me, two of you, yes, God bless you. In the back row, on the aisle, God bless you. Anyone? Yes, you, ma'am, God bless you. Young lady, yes. And you, sir. Anyone over here got his back? Yes, God bless you. Uh, now, if I missed your hand, don't worry, God did not. Those of you that raised your hands, he's been waiting for that for a long time. Would you please pray with the rest of us? We'll do it out loud with you to make it easy. We'll ask God to forgive our sins and take our lives, and he will hear from heaven and do it right where you're standing. So everybody, please say out loud, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen.